Welcome to the lecture on mathematical finance. Today's lecture will focus on one of the most important processes you will encounter in stochastic, namely Martingales. And I would like to discuss during this lecture its properties, in particular its relation to stopping times. Uh, you will also see in that context this discrete stochastic integral popping up as a tool to prove various results. Then I would like to also address the question whether Martingales converges or not and what we can say about that object. And finally, I would like to um, give you a an, an hint on how you can extract from a given stochastic process a Martingale. So let us start rather simple with the definition of a Martingale. So here it is. So for that, I would like to uh, fix once and for all a filter probability space, which I would like to denote as usual with omega, f, f, t, and p. And then a stochastic process, which I would like to denote by x, on our filter probability space is a martingale, or if you would like to emphasize its dependence on the filtration and the law as an f, tp martingale if the following holds true. First of all, our stochastic process should be integrable, meaning that for each time point t in our index set, xt is in L1. Second, our stochastic process should be adapted, meaning that xt is ft measurable for every t. Now comes the most important property, the so-called martingale property, and for that you fix two time points called S and T in your index set with a property that S should be strictly less than T and then it should hold that the conditional expectation of XT given the information stored in the filtration FS is equal to the process at time point S and this holds true P almost surely. And you see if you replace that uh, equality sign in the martingale property by the corresponding inequality signs, you would like to call the resulting process as a sub-martingale if the conditional expectation of xt given fs is larger equal to xs or a super-martingale if the conditional expectation of xt given ss is less than xs, p almost surely. So let us discuss uh, some of the consequences of that um, definition. So here are a couple of remarks. So first of all, the martingale property, and let us focus by now on the martingale property, can ev equivalently be stated as follows, namely that the conditional expectation of xt plus 1 minus xt given um, the information stored in the filtration ft is equal to zero, p almost surely. So you see, one direction is rather simple. It follows from the definition uh, of a martingale, namely the martingale property, and the fact that uh, the process is adapted. Meaning, if you use the um, um, property of measurable factors, you can take out do you split that, that difference here into a sum or a difference of two conditional expectations? And from the later one, you simply can take out xt because xt is ft measurable and the um, theorem on measurable factors allows you to take that um, random variable out of the condition expectation because with respect to that integration you're performing over here, uh, it it's behaves like a constant. And the other direction uh, simply follows by using the tower property of conditional expectations. The second remark is the following. So if x is a sub-martingale, then uh, minus x is a super-martingale. And there's an if and only if relation between that. And this follows simply from these two inequalities because if you take out the minus sign over here and bring it to the other side this um, relation sign changes its row. And in particular you can characterize a martingale uh, 
by the fact that both x and minus x are super martingales or sub martingales. And uh, that observation um, is rather useful because we will formulate later on various theorems for sub respectively super martingales and you see uh, it always will hold true for martingales but you can also derive in most cases the corresponding result for the sub respectively super martingale depending on how the um, theorem was formulated but i would like to discuss that later on uh, a third remark is the following it uh, concerns the expectation of the process so if X is a martingale, then it holds true that the expectation of the process is constant in time. Whereas in case of a sub martingale, you see the um, expectation is increasing in time, whereas for super martingale, it is decreasing in time. Let us come now to a couple of examples. And here is one of the um, uh, most important ones you should keep in mind that will be a good candidate if you would like to test whether a statement is true or not. It's a so-called Levy martingale. What's that? So I give myself um, a r integrable random variable which I would like to call x. And then I would like to define a sequence xt in the following way, namely xt should be simply equal to the conditional expectation of our random variable x um, with respect to the filtration ft. And this I can do for any t in my index set. And then I claim that xt, the sequence xt defined in that way, is a martingale. Why is that? Well. First of all, from the um, definition of condition expectations, we know that xt, defined as in that way, is ft measurable. This was one of the properties of condition expectation. The second observation is that xt is also uh, in L1, meaning it is this random variable is integrable. Well, this follows simply by the triangular inequality for conditional expectations and the second property of the definition of conditional expectations. Um, and now we simply have to check whether the uh, martingale property holds true. And for that, uh, observe that uh, the filtration has this defining property that whenever you give yourself two time points, S and T, and S is strictly less than T, then the, uh, then the sub sigma algebra fs is contained in the sigma algebra ft. But now we can use the tower property, which allows us to rewrite the conditional expectation of xt given fs. First of all, so we use the definition, this is nothing else but the conditional expectation. Um, of a given fs of the random variable which is given as a conditional expectation of x given ft by the tower property as the conditional expectation of um, xs given uh, fs. And now I can use the theorem of measurable factors which allows me to take that random variable out of the conditional expectation. And these uh, equalities hold true uh, in a p almost sure sense. Well, in that way, we have convinced ourselves that indeed the process which you extract from one given random variable is a martingale. Well, the second example is also uh, interesting, uh, namely, it's the so called random walk. So, let me construct that in the following way. So I give myself a sequence of uh, integrable random variables, Zn, which should be independent and, and identically distributed. And I would, would like to construct in the first step um, a filtration. And this I do in the following way. I define F0 to be simply 
as a trivial sigma algebra consisting of the empty set and the fold space. And for any t in the integer uh, in the natural numbers, uh, I define f t as the smallest sigma algebra generated by the random variables uh, uh, z1 up to zt. So this means the sigma algebra which is generated by this uh, process up to time t. Having a filtration at hand, I define the random walk in the following way. I set x0 to be 0, meaning that my process starts deterministically in 0. And uh, I define xt to be simply the partial sum n from 1 to t of these random variables zn. And um, since the zn's are in L1 of p, it follows simply from the triangular inequality that uh, this process is integrable. And moreover, it is adapted. Why? Well, first of all, by the choice that we have here, simply the trivial sigma algebra, this constant function uh, is adapted to it. Uh, and moreover, um, this process, so xt, only depends on the random variables v1 up to the t, meaning that this random variable over here is measurable with respect to that sigma algebra. So we have here an integrable and adapted process. Now we have to check whether the Martingale property holds true or the sub or super Martingale property. And for that, simply let us compute um, the conditional expectation of x t plus 1 given f t. So by linearity, I can rewrite x t plus 1 as x t plus z t plus 1. So that's simply uh, taking advantage of that um, representation over here. And then by linearity, I can rewrite that as the conditional expectation of xt given ft plus the conditional expectation of zt plus 1 given ft. Now using the um, measurable factor property of the conditional expectation, which allows me to take out that um, ft measurable random variable out of that conditional expectation, I obtain here xt and what is left is the condition expectation of z t plus 1 given ft. But by assumption we know that this sequence zn is a sequence of independent random variables. So meaning in particular that the sigma algebra generated by z t plus 1 is independent of the filtration ft because in ft we only store the information um, of the random variable z1 up to zt. So meaning um, that if we use this um, independence property for condition expectation, uh, this condition expectation simply reduces to the expectation of zt plus 1. And now you can use the identically distribution of these uh, elements of that sequence, so we can rewrite that bit over here simply as uh, the expectation of z1. And the same holds true if you consider um, the condition expectation of x1. Well, by definition, this is simply the um, condition expectation of uh, z1 given f0, which is nothing else but the expectation, and since um, the process starts in 0, uh, I ob exactly obtain the same representation over here. And now you see whether we get a sub, super or martingale depends on um, the value of the expectation of z1. Namely, uh, x is a sub martingale if the expectation of z1 is larger or equal to 0. Why? Well, in that case we know that that object is uh, non-negative, so we get, make, uh, get an, a lower bound by xt when we drop that um, term over here. 
in case the expectation of z1 is equal to zero, this term vanishes, and we have here exactly the Martingale property in the equivalent um, formulation of this Martingale property from uh, the previous remark. And likewise, if the um, expectation of the one is non-positive, we get a sub super Martingale because then that term over here is negative. So by dropping it, we get an upper bound by xt. So we have here a wonderful example of a sub super or Martingale. So here's another example, namely a multiplicative random walk. And this example you should keep in mind, uh, which is a kind of model um, um, of the price of a stock market. You will see why uh, later on. So for that again, I consider a sequence um, a ZT, uh, where T is in the natural numbers, and this should be a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables, which are um, integrable. And I would like to choose the mean of the one equal to one. Again, I define the sigma algebra f naught and f t uh, as before. So f naught is simply the trivial sigma algebra and f t is the sigma algebra generated by z1 up to z t. Now I define this multiplicative random walk in the following way. I set x naught to be equal to 1 and x t is simply the product n from 1 to t of these random variables there. And again, this process is then adapted and uh, moreover it's integrable and for checking integrability you simply take advantage of the fact that the vn's are um, independent. Why is that? Well, let's us write down the expectation of the modulus of xt. So this is the same by definition as the expectation of the product of the modulus of the n. By independence you can take out this um, finite product from this expectation. And since the random variables zn are identically distributed, this results in the following expression, namely the expectation of the modulus of z1 to the power t. And this is finite for any t in the natural numbers. So what is left is to uh, check whether the Martingale property holds true. So let us again compute the conditional expectation of xt plus 1 given the filtration ft. Well, by definition, we can rewrite that in the following form, namely it's the condition expectation of the product of xt times zt plus 1, given the filtration ft. Now, you can again take the advantage of the fact that um, xt is adapted, meaning that as this xt here is ft measurable, and by the measurable factors, you can take that out of the condition expectation. So again, what you're left with is now this condition expectation of zt plus 1 given ft. As before, the sequence is independent, hence the sigma algebra generated by zt plus 1 is independent of ft, meaning that this condition expectation reduces to the expectation of the t plus 1, p almost truly. And uh, since these random variables, the um, n are um, identically distributed and moreover, the expectation of the 1 is equal to 1, we know that that term, this factor over here is equal to 1. And in that way, we obtain that this conditional expectation over here equals to xt, hence this process is um, as a Martingale. Let me slightly generalize that example. And that's the exponential Martingale, uh, which we are after now. So again, I fix a sequence ZT of identically and independent random variables. 
And I suppose that there exists a delta uh, uh, positive such that the exponential moment, meaning the expectation of e to the theta z1, is finite for all thetas in the open interval minus delta delta. Again, I consider the filtration uh, constructed in the following way. F0 is the tribute sigma algebra and Ft is the sigma algebra generated by the random variables z1 up to zt. And now I define the so-called log moment generating function. So that's the following map, psi, which maps the open interval minus delta to delta to the reals. In the following way that theta is mapped to the logarithm of the expectation of e to the theta z1. Okay, having that object introduced, now I can define my process which is parameterized by um, theta in the interval minus delta delta in the following way. Uh, the exp uh, so the process at time zero uh, is equal to one for all thetas and x theta t is defined as the expectation of theta, theta times the partial sum n from 1 to t of this random variable vn minus n times psi of theta. So we have to construct somehow that partial sum in the exponential by that deterministic factor. And it will be your task to show that the process defined in that way is a martingale for every theta in that open interval. You should show that uh, theta is strictly convex and once you have uh, convinced yourself that that property holds true, it will be an immediate consequence that the expectation of the uh, square root of the process uh, of this random variable x theta t converges to zero um, uh, as t tends to infinity and this holds true for all theta in this open interval without zero. And this that you have to exclude zero is rather obvious. If you plug in zero over here you see that term vanishes so you get here zero. Moreover if you have a look over here if you plug in here zero you get simply a one and the logarithm of one is also zero so the the process with theta equal to zero is simply the constant process the, which is equal to one. So and this won't converge. So you have to exclude that from that convergence result. And moreover, you can also prove that this process x theta t converges also p almost truly to zero for all theta in this open interval minus delta delta without the zero. Well, let us come now to uh, a small lemma uh, which tells you the following. So consider a martingale, which I would like to denote by x, and the same holds true for sub and super martingales, but for simplicity let us focus on the martingale case. And that martingale is defined on our filtered space, omega f f t p. And now I would like to consider another filtration gt which should be uh, chosen in such a way that um, for every t gt is a sub sigma algebra of ft and if i now assume that the process x which is adapted to that filtration is also adapted to this smaller filtration gt then it holds true that x is also a martingale with respect to the smaller filtration. And the second statement is the following. If you have a, a convex function phi and you know additionally that the expectation of the modulus of phi of xt is finite for every t in your index set, then if x is a martingale and uh, the process phi of xt is a sub-martingale. 
And additionally, if uh, this convex function phi is monotone increasing and x is a submartingale, then this process phi of xt is again a submartingale. And you see, which we have discussed in the remark before, uh, minus x will be in that later case a super martingale. Then you see you have to change in that theorem the monotone increasing by monotone decreasing to get a similar um, statement out of that. But have a think about that on your own. So let us uh, have a look at the proof of this small lemma. And I would like to focus on the martingale case. So if x is a martingale, well, now we can take advantage of the fact uh, that by assumption x is adapted to the smaller filtration and that gt is a sub-sigma algebra of ft. And then we can use the tower property. So meaning, so we would like to convince ourselves that the martingale property holds also true with respect to this filtration G. So we would like to prove that the expectation of Xt given Gs is equal to Xs for every time point S and T in my index set with a property that S is less than or equal to T. But what do we know? By assumption, we know that Xt is an Ft martingale, meaning I can first of all write um, xt simply as um, the um, using the tower property of in the following way, namely as the conditional expectation of xt given fs. So this is simply using the tower property and the fact that fs is uh, uh, contains the sigma algebra. Uh, Gs. And now, since x is a martingale, this condition expectation over here simply reduces to this random variable xs, that's a martingale property. Now you use measurable factors to take that random variable out of the condition expectation, and in that way you have proven that indeed, in case that um, x is adapted to uh, this filtration gt, um, we are ending up with a GT martingale in that way. And the same holds true for um, sub and super martingales as well. Let us come now to this uh, Jensen inequality or an application of the Jensen inequality. So uh, suppose that phi is a convex function and the expectation of the modulus of phi of xt is finite. What do we know then? Well, first of all, we know that this process phi of xt is adapted. That's trivial. But it's also integrable due to that additional condition. So what we, what we are left with is to check um, the submartingale property. And for that, I fix two time points s and t uh, in my index set with the property that s is less than t. And then I would like to apply to that conditional expectation over here the Jensen inequality for conditional expectations. And this one allows me to get a lower bound of, of that expression by simply taking out the convex function. So and then I can use here the fact that x is a martingale. So I use now the martingale property to rewrite that conditional expectation of xt given fs as x of s. And in that way, I have um, shown uh, or proven the submartingale property for that process. And you see what you have to change in case um, that x is not a martingale but a submartingale. Well, then here the equality does not hold. And that's why you should impose a further condition on this convex function phi, namely that it is monotone increasing. Why? Well, by the sub-martingale property, you, would, you will estimate that conditional expectation from below by uh, xs. And in order to get here the right inequality sign, 
you simply have to use that the function phi is monotone increasing. And in that way, you also prove that statement for sub-martingales. And as a corollary of that, uh, here is um, a kind of a convex function which we will see later on in the content, uh, context of uh, European um, call and put options. Namely that uh, if I consider a sub-martingale on my filtered space, I fix uh, a parameter a in the reals, which will be later on the strike price. And I consider the, uh, the following convex function, namely uh, the function uh, x minus a positive part. So that's a function which is a zero for all x which are less than or equal to a, and afterwards it's linear increase. Um, and you see, as a corollary, we know that that process over here is a sub martingale because that function um, x minus a positive part as a function of x is monotone increasing. Well, and that's more or less the whole proof. We only have to check that uh, this condition that the expectation of the modulus of phi of xt is finite holds true. Um, but this is a simple computation, namely, so we have remarked that phi of xt is given by this um, x minus a positive part. It's a monotone increasing function. It's a convex function. And we can bound um, um, xt minus a, a positive part in the following way. Well, it's simply the modulus of a plus the expectation of the modulus of xt. And since xt is a sub martingale we know xt is integrable so that term here is finite and moreover for any a in the reals that term as well is finite hence we are allowed to apply uh, the Jensen inequality uh, to that uh, sub martingale and in that way we obtain that that process over here is a sub martingale let us now come to the following theorem, namely I would like to address the relation between um, martingales, respectively sub and super martingales, and discrete stochastic integrals. And this theorem uh, goes under the name martingale transform. So for that let me consider a martingale which I would look like to denote by x defined on our filtered probability space. And moreover, I would like to consider a predictable stochastic process called uh, here HT, uh, which is, uh, and the predictability holds true with respect to the filtration given in our filtered probability space. And additionally, I would like to assume that this process HT is bounded. What does it mean? Well, for every t in the natural numbers, um, the function ht of omega uh, is bounded away from infinity. And then it holds true that the discrete stochastic integral, denoting here by h big dot x, is a martingale. And moreover, if x is a sub or super martingale, and additionally, and that this process H is non-negative and bounded um, and predictable, as in the part A, then this um, discrete stochastic integral H dot X is a sub respectively a super if X is a super Well, now you see why we introduced um, predictable or previsible processes. Namely, exactly to obtain that martingale transform. And you see why. So, okay, since H is bounded, what do we know? So, we first of all know that this random variable H dot X T, which was nothing else but the sum N from 1 to T of H N 
times the difference xn minus xn minus 1 is an L1. Why? Now you see, I have to compute the expectation of the modulus of um, uh, that random variable. Now I can simply uh, use the triangular inequality to bring the modulus inside uh, that um, finite sum over here. In that way I obtain the modulus of hn times the modulus of the difference of our process. And uh, then I can bring out that finite sum from the uh, exchange that was the expectation by linearity of the expectation. Moreover, I simply estimate that difference over here by the sum of the modulus of these two random variables. And then I, uh, from that I simply get here the factor 2 because I get more or less each assignment twice. And um, also we know that um, this random variable h is uh, bounded, meaning that this term over here um, is finite for every uh, value n. And in that way I get a finite upper bound. So we have convinced ourselves that, that the, every uh, random variable h dot x t is in L1. Moreover, we should convince ourselves that this process is adapted. Well, why is that true? So have a look at that sum over here. So these terms over here are adapted because the process X is adapted. These differences are adapted because they do not look into the future and they only look into the past. And by assumption, that process over here is uh, as a predictable process, so meaning that h of f n uh, h of n is f n minus one measurable, meaning that this whole term over here is indeed, if I sum up to t, is f t measurable. Okay, what remains? It remains to check whether the Martingale property holds true, and for that. I give myself a time point t and the natural numbers including zero and I compute the conditional expectation of this stochastic integral at time point t plus one given the information stored in this filtration ft. Analog to the example of the random walk, since this thing is given as a sum, I can decompose it into two summons, namely the stochastic integral up to time t and the last factor which is h of t plus 1 times this difference uh, x of t plus 1 minus x of t. So now using again the linearity of the conditional expectation and uh, the theorem on the measure of the factors allows me to first of all take out that part from the conditional expectation because that part over here is ft measurable. Moreover, since the process h is predictable, I also know that that random variable over here is um, ft measurable, so I can take it out as well from the conditional expectation. And what I'm left with is the conditional expectation of the difference between x t plus 1 minus x t. But since x is a martingale by assumption, so this we assumed over here, we know that this difference is simply zero. And in that way, we exactly proved the, uh, the martingale property. Hence, this discrete stochastic uh, integral is indeed a martingale. And that's why the theorem is also called martingale transform. And analogously, you can prove this theorem in case x is a sub, respectively a super martingale. And you see what you have to assume additionally, namely that that random variable over here should be non-negative. Otherwise, you have a problem with um, estimating that part over here, because then for sub, respectively a super martingale, you can only get that that conditional expectation is larger or less than or equal to zero, and you would like to keep the same 
direction of inequality, that's why you have to assume that this process H should be non-negative.